Well, I'd like to welcome you all to the third year of the Justice Center's sponsoring of the National Criminal Justice Month activities. And this is the third and final activity of Criminal Justice Month that the Justice Center is uh, sponsoring. In addition to sponsoring, the, the Justice Center sponsoring this, the uh, UAA Justice Club and the UAA Pre-Law Society, which are all uh, also housed within the Justice Center. I, I'd like to welcome you all to our uh, presentation and, and thank you for coming out. Uh, I'll make some brief remarks and then we'll pass this on to uh, Walt Monaghan, who will be the moderator for tonight's uh, panel. Um, you probably all saw the uh, flyers uh, floating around in some fashion or another. We do this every year and we hope to see you again uh, next year for the, pre the, the, the events that we're going to try to do this on an annual basis. I'm the acting director. My name's Alan Barnes. And I've been here quite some time, and I have probably seen a, a lot of you, and Walt and I had a good conversation earlier. We seem to go way back, apparently. I'd like to also introduce uh, Dr. Andre Rosé, who's the real director and the real force behind the Justice Center, uh, back from Washington. So glad to have you back. Thank you very much. Um, the uh, National Criminal Justice Month is kind of sponsored by the Academy of Criminal Justice Sciences and by the federal government as a way of kind of improving the efficiency and discussions about justice issues, criminal justice issues, social justice issues that uh, kind of pervade our society. So they're kind of eclectic and we have a variety of, of topics over the course of the event. So we hope that uh, as you think about these, uh, the ones that you've attended and the ones that we'll probably be presenting next year, <coughs> we, we hope that you will uh, take advantage of those and maybe tell other people as well. Um, we have uh, the videotaping that's going on and the podcasting that's going on. And so I'd like for you to turn off your cell phones at the moment. So when we're doing this uh, later on or when it's on Channel 2 News, uh, they're, they're not these ringings and clingings and clangings that uh, seem to go on. So thank you very much for doing that. Um, there are some materials by the door. If you've not picked up any, uh, we hope that you might do that. And uh, we have uh, podcast uh, uh, blogs, uh, justice uh, forum articles, justice uh, publications of all kinds, and we hope that you might sign up to receive those, and, and <coughs> they're free, and we hope that you would uh, take advantage of those as well. Um, we also have uh, a sign-up sheet for those of you who are um, needing the CLEs. This is two credits from the Bar Association, and you'll need to sign up uh, for that over there, and but the forms are by the door. Uh, there are refreshments uh, available behind the, the speakers, and so you should help yourself to those as well. Um, we have uh, a variety of materials that are going to be available as a result of this. I mentioned the podcast, but uh, those are all going to be available, and you should think about uh, bookmarking the Justice Center website because all kinds of things are available through that, including almost everything that's going on tonight, uh, biographies and um, PowerPoint presentations and etc. Well, I would like to again thank you all for uh, for being here, and I would now like to turn it over to uh, Walt Monaghan, who the former chief, former uh, all kinds of state officials, and <laughs> okay, just former a whole bunch of things as it turns out. Walt Monaghan. <laughs> Well, good evening. I, hopefully you can hear me without me having to hold this up. Can you? I mean, I used to be a cop, so I can kick in both lungs when I have to. <laughs> I'd like to uh, let you know my name is Walt Monaghan. I'm with the Alaska Native Justice Center, though I think I was asked to be here to moderate because I used to be a cop. I want to thank all of you for showing up here, for the interest that you're going to, uh, that you have in in issues like tribal courts. I think it's one of those things that I hope that someday everybody will be as interested and in this arena, which is kind of unexplored in the real world of uh, justice. So I appreciate you being here, all of you, because I think you are the leaders that can make good, effective changes later on down the line. We have a distinguished panel of experts on tribal courts here tonight. But before I introduce them, I'd like to take a moment to share an old cop's perspective on jurisdiction, or 
Rather, as a friend of ours, Dave Rosh, who's, who's a friend of all of ours over here, what he would say, it's not our jurisdiction, it's our responsibility, which I think is a better word for it. You know, a few years ago, when I was the chief at APD, periodically I'd rotate through uh, all the community councils and imagine going to a community council meeting and hearing basically, we need more police presence in our neighborhood. There's too much crime. Now, I could try to argue that, you know, showing them percentages and whatnot, but I finally decided the best way to handle that was just to say, you know, the most effective police force any community can have are the citizens themselves. You are more effective than I. If you get, take time to <coughs> learn and get to know your neighbors, you can watch each other's back far be better than any cop cr cruising down the street. I'd get a lot of quizzical kind of looks when that would happen. So what I would <coughs> try to explain, okay, you and I are neighbors. We live across the street from each other. You told me that you're gonna be heading off down to the Kenai and do some dip netting this weekend. You're gonna take your whole family. So Saturday morning, I get up, I pour myself a mug of coffee and I walk over to look out the window to see what kind of day it is. And I see a strange truck parked in your driveway. And I know you're gone. Now the cop car that just drove right past us doesn't know which car belongs in which driveway. But I, as your neighbor, know which one should belong in yours. So if that makes sense to you, neighbors watching out for neighbors, not being snoopy, but getting to know and trust is a far more effective police force. And if you can take that principle and people being empowered and understanding each other and they apply it instead of a neighborhood to a village, to a community, people watching others' backs, <coughs> helping out. You know, I'll, those who study police sciences know that crime's strongest ally is apathy. People don't want to get involved. I don't care what happens outside my door. Well, that's when crime runs wild out there. So I wanted to share that with you. <coughs> So, your experts tonight, Kevin Illingworth, he is with the University of Alaska Fairbanks and he is the head of the tribal management. Lisa Yeager who is, is with the Tanana Chiefs Conference. Natalie Landreth from the Native American Rights Fund. And Magistrate Judge Chris McLean from the Alaska Court System in Galena. And with that, I think that's my part where I'm done at the moment. So Kevin, you're up. <laughs> well, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Kevin Illingworth, and I am. Okay. <laughs> Um, I am an assistant professor with uh, UAF Tribal Management Program. I work for the Interior Aleutians campus, which means uh, my office is in Fairbanks, but I spend most of my time out in rural Alaska teaching. Um, uh, the Tribal Management Program was developed uh, in response to federal recognition of Alaska tribes. What I'm here to talk about tonight is the idea of tribal sovereignty and tribal courts. So. Um, what I'm going to do is try to just give a little bit of a background on tribal sovereignty, what that means, how that applies to tribal courts, and then you're going to hear from the rest of the presenters, I think, uh, more specifically about tribal courts and about tribal jurisdiction. So go ahead. Is this the okay? Yeah. So this word sovereignty, I actually just clipped this out of uh, dictionary.com. And I picked this one, actually, because it's different from most definitions of sovereignty. Uh, when we talk about <coughs> sovereignty, we tend to think of sovereignty as something that's absolute. And when we think of the rise of the nation states, it used to be something that we said people were either sovereign or a nation was sovereign or they were not. And it was one way or the other. Uh, as it turns out, sovereignty really is not that way anymore. Um, to talk about that in the sense of the United States, we say the United States government is sovereign, and it is. However, the United States has given up large amounts of its sovereignty. 
uh, to different organizations like the WTO, the, the International Criminal Court, the United Nations, we've voluntarily given up our sovereignty. In the same way, tribes started out uh, as complete sovereigns and through time have given up some of their sovereignty. I, I chose this one because it talks about uh, the quality or state of being sovereign, exercising sovereign authority, a rightful status, um, but this middle one, a power, authority, and government as possessed or claimed by a state or community, I think is important. When we're talking about tribes, when we're talking about tribal courts, we're really just talking about communities. Um, these are just communities that want to have their own self-determination, their own local control, the same way that any other community does. The only difference is, is that they have a little special status under the law. So tribal sovereignty, as compared to, to uh, sovereignty in general, the difference under the United States law is that when we're talking about tribal sovereignty, we recognize that that sovereignty is inherent. It's what we call inherent sovereignty. It's a recognition by the federal government that tribal authority existed prior to the formation of the United States. Tribes held their sovereignty before the United States was formed. This means that governments have inherent sovereignty that does not come from the federal government or the state government, but from the people themselves. Now, through my presentation, I've tried to put in quotes from the United States Supreme Court, from the Alaska Supreme Court, to try to uh, let you see what the justices' opinions are, are on sovereignty. So this is a very common quote from the United States Supreme Court. Indian tribes have inherent powers deriving from a sovereign status. Their claim to sovereignty long predates the, the, that of our own government. <clears throat> I want to talk about inherent sovereignty and, what's, and, and that this is a unique concept to United States law. And this is really the, the, the foundation of federal Indian law and, and why United States law is unique. In other countries, and uh, for example, Canada, um, their legal theory is that any authority, <coughs> any sovereign authority that First Nations had were taken away by the Queen and the queen delegates authority back to tribes, back to First Nations to act uh, on their behalf. They're very specific authorities that they could exercise. It's very different from the United States where we recognize this idea of inherent authority. Inherent authority essentially means that tribes have all the sovereign authority that they have ever had unless that was specifically taken away by the United States Congress. So it really turns things on, the, on its head. Tribes have all the sovereign authority that they have ever had unless that was specifically taken away by the United States Congress. This is a quote from Felix Cohen. Perhaps the most basic principle of all Indian law is the principle that those powers which are lawfully vested in an Indian tribe are not, in general, delegated powers granted by express acts of Congress but rather inherent powers of a limited sovereign that has never been extinguished. This is our foundation, this is our starting point for federal Indian law. Tribes have sovereignty that has never been extinguished. Now, this makes figuring out what tribal sovereignty means more difficult. We're not able to just go look at a statute, we're not able to go look at a law and say, oh, well look, this says tribes can do this. In fact, we have to do the opposite. We have to go look for laws that say, what can tribes not do? Now, that being said, tribes do have two sources of authority. Their primary source of authority to, uh, for a tribe is inherent authority. But tribes do get additional authority from the federal government. They can be delegated authority from the federal government as well. So things like the Indian Child Welfare Act, the Tribal Law and Order Act, Violence Against Women Act, these are all specific delegations of authority from the federal government as well. So I included this one. Uh, most of my classes that I teach, I teach to tribal councils. Um, and so we talk about the, what tribal sovereignty means to the tribal council and this pathway of, of exercising sovereignty. And this, I think, is really important. Sovereign, mem <coughs> sovereign authority belongs to the members. Inherent authority is a recognition that there is something unique about indigenous peoples. There is something unique about them that's held inside of them. And it's called inherent sovereignty. The tribal members can delegate some of those powers to the tribal council to exercise on their behalf. And they do that usually through constitutions. Additionally, tribal members can reserve some powers to themselves. 
The important thing, I think, to remember about tribal sovereignty is that it is something that comes inherently from the tribal members. Now, I, in trying to talk about a history of sovereignty in Alaska, I went through and, and highlighted a few of the important events that I want to just talk about for a few minutes. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on some of them, but these are things that I think impacted sovereignty here in Alaska. So the first event that had a big impact on sovereignty in Alaska was Russian, Russian colonization. Prior to Russian contact, tribes in Alaska were absolute sovereigns. They had absolute sovereign authority to make all the decisions on their behalf. After Russian contact, those tribes that were uh, underneath Russian dominion or, or uh, the sphere of influence, their sovereignty was diminished. Um, after the purchase of Alaska by the United States, all tribal sovereignty in Alaska was diminished. Now, I, I make that point for a quick second because uh, note that under Russian colonization, only the tribes <laughs> that were underneath Russian dominion had their sovereignty diminished. Under federal Indian law, when we purchased Alaska, the federal government essentially said all tribes were now under the authority of the United States and all of their sovereignty was diminished by being subject to federal Indian law. Whether they had had contact with Russians, whether they had any contact with the United States at all, under US legal theory, that sovereignty was diminished. Now when the United States purchased Alaska, uh, it was through the Treaty of Session. Uh, David Case is fond of saying the Treaty of Session was not a treaty with Indian tribes, but in fact it was a treaty about Indian tribes. And the word tribe is used quite often in the Treaty of Session. Um, so there is no doubt that the United States recognized that the indigenous people of Alaska were tribes. And in fact, the Treaty of Session said that the uncivilized tribes would be subject to the same laws that the United States passes over their indigenous people of the lower 48. Now this term uncivilized tribes that the Russians used, that alone caused all sorts of confusion because People then ask, well, who are the civilized tribes? It's doubtful that Russia felt there were civilized tribes. That's how they were referring to people that were not underneath Russian dominion. In fact, the Russian-American company had different uh, rules in, in who could return to Russia, who had to stay in the United States. And so it really had to do whether you were adopting Russian culture and becoming part of a, uh, the Russian community. If you were not, you were subject to federal Indian law. Now the reality is, is uh, no tribes in Alaska were considered to be civilized under United States law and federal Indian law has been applied to all tribes in the state of Alaska equally. After the Treaty of Session, um, we went through some uh, period of what I would call neglect by the federal government, where the federal government really did not have a whole lot of interest in Alaska, certainly not a lot of interest in uh, recognizing tribes working with tribal people. Um, this early period in Alaska, uh, again, we hear people say that, that the federal uh, Indian law is like a pendulum, that there's this vacillating policy here in Alaska. And the federal government for years was not clear whether they were going to recognize tribes in Alaska the same way they recognized tribes in the lower 48. In fact, originally, uh, programs and services for, for Alaska Native people were not underneath the Bureau of Indian Affairs. They were under the Bureau of Education. Sheldon Jackson was the administrator for the Bureau of Education. He's the one that started education, uh, started economic development programs, uh, federal laws to protect subsistence started during that time. Um, and in fact, during that period, there were over 150 reservations formed in the state of Alaska. So even though it was under the Bureau of Education, there was this massive effort by the federal government to exert federal Indian law in Alaska. 1931, that was uh, transferred to the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Um, and I think I have a... Uh, in 1932, a solicitor's opinion, and the solicitor is the head lawyer for the Department of Interior. It is clear that no distinction has been or can be made between the Indians and other natives of Alaska so far as the laws and relations of the United States are concerned. Prior to statehood, it was clear to the federal government that tribes in Alaska should be treated as tribes, that the sovereignty of tribes should be respected. 
um, of course, statehood was the next thing that happened. And we had the Alaska Statehood Act. Now, the Statehood Act is important because it did, in fact, recognize an aboriginal land claim, an aboriginal hunting and fishing rights, recognizing the sovereignty of tribes. It didn't do anything about it. It said it was going to be up to Congress what to do about it. But it mentioned it and said that the state of Alaska could not take those lands, couldn't harm the interests that tribes had in that land. So while statehood uh, was a big change, it actually had very little impact on this idea of sovereignty. One thing that did have an impact on sovereignty, uh, or politically anyway, was the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act. Now, I say that because the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act, uh, while it was simply a lands claims act, uh, was interpreted by many people of having a huge impact on tribal sovereignty and in some way diminishing tribal sovereignty. And in fact, there are people that argued that the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act was a termination of tribal sovereign status. This is a quote from the Alaska Supreme Court in John versus Baker about the Ala Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act. Ample evidence exists that Congress did not intend for ANCSA to divest tribes of their powers to adjudicate domestic disputes between members. Congress intended ANCSA to free Alaska Natives from the dictates of Lake the Wardship or Trusteeship, not to handicap tribes by divesting them of their sovereign powers. Nowhere does the law express any intent to force Alaska Natives to abandon their sovereignty. So while the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act did have a big impact on our perception of sovereignty for many years, it turns out uh, in 1991 was the John versus Baker decision, or 1999 was the John versus Baker decision, that according to the Alaska Supreme Court, the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act had no impact on tribal sovereignty. After the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act came 1993 federal recognition and the 1994 federally recognized Tribe List Act. Uh, Ada Deer was uh, responsible for federal recognition in Alaska. Um, she is a Menominee whose tribe was terminated uh, during the 1950s and then were later restored. After coming to Alaska, she said that she felt like she was visiting terminated communities that people were not recognizing the sovereignty of Alaska tribes. And she felt that it was the federal government needed to make clear that in fact tribes in Alaska were federally recognized and did have the same authority as tribes everywhere. So in 1993, she included them uh, in the federal register on a list of tribes. 1994, that list was ratified by the United States Congress and they added Klingit Haida Central Council as a tribe as well. So in 1994, the idea that there are tribes in Alaska was cemented in federal Indian law. This is uh, State of Alaska Administrative Order 186, signed in September of 2000 by the governor of the state of Alaska. Tribes existed in Alaska before the formation of the United States and the state of Alaska. The existence of tribes in Alaska and their inherent sovereignty has been recognized by all three branches of the federal government. This administrative order goes on to establish a government-to-government -government relationship between the state of Alaska and the federally recognized Indian tribes in Alaska. This administrative order has been largely ignored, but since 2000, the state of Alaska has recognized tribes and has established a government-to-government -government relationship with tribal governments in Alaska. This is uh, John versus Baker. Um, uh, tribal sovereignty stems from two intertwined sources, tribal membership and tribal land. Uh, I'm not going to read this whole thing, but it's Indian tribes are unique aggregations possess possessing attributes of sovereignty over both members and territory. Now, when I'm talking about sovereign, uh, tribal sovereignty, I do want to make clear that in 1998, the Venati tax case said that tribal authority over land Tribal jurisdiction over land is largely diminished. However, tribes have sovereignty over both land and over their members. And so when I'm talking about tribal sovereignty, I am talking about sovereignty regarding members and not specifically about land. Right. So again, inherent authority is the primary source of tribal authority for tribal governments to operate their justice system. This is a quote from John versus Baker again. And I want to linger on this one just for a few minutes. Do Alaska Native villages have inherent 
non-territorial sovereignty, allowing them to resolve <laughs> domestic disputes between their own members. We hold that Alaska Native tribes, by virtue of their inherent powers as sovereign nations, do possess that authority. This is the Alaska Supreme Court, first off, recognizing the inherent sovereignty of tribes, referring to them as sovereign nations, and also making it clear that this is non-territorial. They do not need Indian country. They do not need a territorial basis in order to exercise their sovereignty. Because Alaska Native tribes have inherent sovereignty to adjudicate internal tribal disputes, tribes must be able to apply their tribal law to those disputes. Thus, tribal sovereignty over issues like family relations includes the right to enforce tribal law in resolving disputes. Part of tribal sovereignty means that tribes have the authority to make and enforce their own laws. In fact, it must mean that they have the authority to make and enforce their own laws. Tribal courts are not new, and I think this is important. We use this term tribal court, and this term tribal court is new, but tribal justice systems have always existed as long as there has been tribes. Um, the tribal court is just a modern manifestation of the traditional justice system. Uh, I came across an article that was written in 19... Uh, 72 by Arthur Hippler and Stephen Kahn, Traditional Athabascan Lawways. It was eye-opening to me because it was it, done with interviews uh, in tribal communities that had not had much contact. And it was Athabascan elders talking about their traditional lawways and how those traditional lawways worked. Uh, incredibly complex systems of justice. Not simple tribal courts like we're seeing now, not simple state court like Alaska State Court, but incredibly complex systems of justice built on relationships between people, between families, and between villages. Um, very strict rules that everybody knew. So some things tribal courts are hearing today, and I'm just going to go rattle off a list of cases, that tri things that tribes are doing through their tribal courts, and you'll hear more about these later. So the most common cases tribes are hearing are adoptions, child custody, child protection, ICWA interventions. Tribes are doing marriages, divorces, probate, inheritance, hearing cases involving cultural protections <coughs> and domestic violence. Tribes are hearing cases involving driving under the influence, assault, disorderly conduct, juvenile delinquency, vandalism and misuse of a firearm, trespass, and of course, drug and alcohol regulation. Other things that tribes are doing through tribal court, through their tribal government, are things like hearing contract and employment disputes. They're making environmental regulations. They're doing natural resource regulation and management. And as I said before, tribes are doing cultural protections through their tribal court as an important thing that they do. I want to leave everybody with this last quote by the Alaska Supreme Court. By acknowledging tribal jurisdiction, we enhance the opportunity for native villages in the state to cooperate. Recognizing the ability of power of tribes to resolve internal disputes in their own forums while preserving the right of access to state courts can only help in the administration of justice for all. I think that's an important idea. I think it's uh, important because uh, a, a lot of the work I do is in child protection cases, working with kids. Uh, and I really think of this as, as uh, safety nets, tribal authority really as a safety net. The state of Alaska has OCS, they have a safety net there. But if any of you have ever traveled around Alaska um, or are familiar with rural Alaska, OCS is here in Anchorage. And OCS is in Fairbanks and they're in the valley. They're not out in the village. Kids have to fall a long ways to get caught by that OCS safety net. Tribal sovereignty and the tribe is there right away to make sure that people can get help when they need it, that they don't have to wait, that they don't have to call somebody outside of the community, that people can be safe in their own communities. To me, that's what tribal sovereignty is about. It really is about taking care of your own community, making sure that people are safe, making sure that it's a good place to live. I don't think that tribal sovereignty 
the reason why people want to exercise their tribal sovereignty is very different than any other reason why people want to exercise local control. It's self-determination. People want to have a say over their own lives. And I think that's what the root of tribal sovereignty is. I think that's it. So thank you. Uh, Chinan, I sh apologize. I should have started by recognizing we are in uh, Eklutna territory. And I apologize for not saying that first. Um, Chinan, thank you. All right. I'm falling down on my job here. Yeah. Sorry. Our next speaker is going to be Lisa Yeager with the Tanana Chiefs Conference. She's another person that uh, I have attended and admired for what the training that she does. So please, Lisa. Thank you very much. All right, we'll gear up this PowerPoint here. Um, we appreciate so much being able. Is I don't know. Is it is it on now? Can you hear me now? <laughs> All right. Okay, very good. We really appreciate that uh, the Justice Center here at UAA is um, offering this forum on tribes, tribal courts, um, and that um, there are courses being taught these days at the university campus, both here and in Fairbanks, about tribes. I started working for the tribes back in 1979. And at that time, there was no information hardly available. There was the Felix Cohen Handbook on Federal Indian Law um, and uh, a few things. So um, there was uh, not much available. And the state has made a lot of progress um, since that time in terms of offering trainings and educational opportunities. Um, I guess he's my remote back here. So just uh, briefly, I, I work in the Tanana Chiefs region is that area in blue. It's uh, the size of Texas. It's the whole interior of Alaska. Um, there are 37 federally recognized tribes there, but I've had the opportunity to go all over the state. I've been way out in the Pribilof Islands and way out in the Aleutians and all over. I've had the opportunity to work um, pretty much all over. So <coughs> and it has been a fantastic journey. It is a story. Um, that um, Kevin started to tell the story, and I'm going to be continuing to tell the story because we can't understand where we're at right now with tribes with, unless we know something about the history that's led us to where we are now. And Kevin, I think, made this point before already that um, traditional justice systems were here, of course, since time immemorial. But one thing I want to point out is sometimes you hear people say, well, this is the way the Indians always did it or whatever. Um, there was different things happening all over the state into uh, all different um, ways of dealing with justice, clan systems, potlatching, um, some were using circles and talking and things like that. So there wasn't one stereotype way of traditional justice um, in, in Alaska. Now, when um, missionaries came along and the school started um, being out into the villages, one of the things that happened is that they kind of organized these village councils. That was back at the t about, about, you know, back in the about turn of the century or so. They organized village councils, and the people in the villages sort of populated them with their kind of go-to people, the best hunters and, 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 and folks like that. So the village councils, when you think about it, when it was just a district here in Alaska, how many, how many, uh, Judges from the f state government were there, or from the federal government, like one for all of Alaska, right? So these, um, and, it, and it didn't get to be a whole lot more for quite a while. So these village councils um, were really kind of local um, law enforcement, justice dispute, uh, regulation boards. And so it's not, um, it's not foreign that today out in the villages, a lot of the tribal courts are councils. Okay, this is something that, a, a system that, that they were used to for, for quite a while. <coughs> now those were really kind of um, in power um, in, in, in justice up through about statehood. And after statehood, back in the late 50s, um, the system of magistrates um, came in. And there were a lot of magistrates that were now sprinkled throughout the villages. And so the village council, in terms of its dispute, reg, uh, dispute uh, re resolution, um, kind of was not as much in use, okay, after that point in time. Um, so that was kind of the time when, the, when that power kind of started to diminish, was when there was a lot more state presence around. 
So we move up into the 1970s, the passage of the Claims Act left questions. Were there still tribes in Alaska? Um, you know, and it also left unresolved really the issue of subsistence, which is a whole nother story, but we're not going to go there. But we know that in 1975, <coughs> Congress passed an act called the Indian Self-Determination and Education Act. And they applied it to Alaska, which meant the Alaska Native people could actually run their own services that the Bureau used to run. So we know, okay, they only do that if there's tribes. And so we know that we had a federal trust responsibility still in Alaska after the Claims Act. And then in 1978, <coughs> excuse me, I don't know where my water went. One of the most important, um, I think, acts, and you can say this about almost every of these big acts, how important they were, but this one, the Indian Child Welfare Act, um, was passed and it was designed to stop the taking of Indian children, the Alaska Native children, out of their homes and placed in non-Native families. And so it was an extraordinarily important act because one in four um, nationwide um, American Indian and Alaska Native children were taken out of their home and adopted to a non-Native home, someplace far away from where they lived <coughs> for the most part. So it was a very critically important act. Well, I started working for Tanana Chiefs in 1979, okay, the year right after. So that's, um, go ahead. So I started in 1979 working for Tanana Chiefs Conference. We're thinking, how are we going to get um, recognition of tribes in Alaska, okay, and what their powers would be? We had a three pronged strategy at Tanana Chiefs. One was Indian Child Welfare Act passed opportunity to form tribal courts and to take care of tribal children. Two was that we were going to get um, Alaska um, Native uh, people and tribes listed in federal legislation as much as we could, and so we were back in Washington, D.C., including them specifically. It'd say American Indian, and we'd, get, we'd go Alaska Native uh, villages, too, in there, so we uh, worked on that. <coughs> and then the third one was to go out and get um, or villages organized under the Indian Reorganization Act so um, to help to, to, to prove that we had tribes. So, but the one we're going to focus on now is the formation of the tribal courts. So we started, um, of course the village councils were already in place, it was already sort of a familiar tool, so we started with using the village councils um, there for the tribal courts. Um, the first time that tribe removed a children, child from its home was in 86, um, and the state court decided in 86 also that they weren't going to transfer any of the ICWA cases to tribes. I think, maybe we can go back one slide. They go backwards. The, the other backwards. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, yeah, L yeah. Just, just this one for a second here, yeah. The first time was in 84, um, and this was uh, that when we first started doing the tribal court cases, we did it in cases where everyone was in agreement. Parents all agreed that this was a good thing, so, you know, there was nobody protesting these early cases that we were doing there. And we first started our first tribal court training at that time back in 1984. So this is the 30th annual, I think, this year, 31st annual tribal court training, so we'll go move, move forward. <coughs> so back, so in the 80s, state of Alaska is still saying there's no tribes in Alaska. We're still telling our tribes in the interior, you, yes, you're a tribe, go ahead, do tribal court, take care of your children, we'll help you do it in the best way possible. This is a way Alaska Native people have gained, I think, uh, jurisdiction, is by going ahead and just taking care of business and doing cases. If they would have sat and said, waited to tell, well, when is the state or the federal government gonna say it's okay for us to do it? That would never have happened. Okay, so I think that's an important thing to know. Right now, we're in kind of jurisdictional limbo on certain things, um, misdemeanors, um, different things like that. Well, the tribes are just gonna go ahead and take care of business. They're not gonna wait for the federal government to say, Okay, you can do that. <coughs> so anyway, we started, um, so you'll see a lot of these cases um, are coming from our region. 
Okay, there, there was uh, Northway, Ninana, Stevens Village, um, back to Ninana. So, and that was because I think Tanana Chiefs was really there telling the tribes, yes, go ahead and do it. We'll help you do it in the best way that you can. <coughs> so finally, it, in the 90s, because the tribes were active and doing a lot of different things, um, we finally ended up getting kind of a clarification, a formal recognition by Congress, um, by, um, the, by the list um, that uh, Kevin was mentioning. So we still continued to uh, conduct child custody cases, child protection cases, um, and we even had a fair amount of cooperation from the state agencies um, by this time in about, in somewhere in the 90s, in the Tanana Chiefs region, that big blue area that I showed you, about at any given time, half the children that are in custody, legal custody, are in tribal, and the other half are in state custody. The tribes don't take every single um, case. They kind of pick and choose cases, and there's some reasons why they don't want to do certain cases. So it's been running about that since about the 1990s. And then um, courts were also addressing other things. Kevin had a pretty good list of some of the other things that um, the tribal courts deal with. Two real important cases in the 1990s, Venati tax case. Um, and that, that one basically said, if <coughs> land went through the Claims Act, it's no longer Indian country. Okay, so a lot of people, and as Natalie would say, legal scholars, professors, um, assumed that if there's no Indian country, there's no jurisdiction. Okay, so they wouldn't have any power. We were still telling our tribes, go ahead. You still keep protecting the children, you still, still keep, keep doing these cases. And in 1999, we had the case that Kevin was referring to, this John versus Baker, and they said, our Alaska Supreme Court said, gee, since the last time we talked about this, 10 years before, a lot of things have happened. Yes, there are tribes in Alaska. And not only are there tribes in Alaska, they have jurisdiction even without the Indian country. And so we look to what we call sort of membership-based jurisdiction. So it's real important for the tribes to know who their members are and have a pretty detailed idea of who their members are. So that they have jurisdiction over their members and we argue to protect the health and safety of their members. <coughs> so a bunch more cases. So finally got tribal recognition in the 90s. Have, can stop arguing about that now. And so the arguments really then from then on and continuing till now and continuing into the future was how much jurisdiction do they have? What does that jurisdiction look like? And so we continue to argue the cases. Natalie is going to talk about some things when she speaks, because she's the one that's in the trenches arguing some of these cases. And it's starting to shape up. Um, we have finally, in 2001 in Nikolai, it's another Tana Chiefs case um, in the Tana Chiefs <coughs> region, um, the, we had been getting uh, uh, cases transferred to our tribal courts from California, Oklahoma, you know, all over the country except Alaska, okay? Didn't get cases transferred from state court to tribal court until, until 2001 in this case here. And then in the more recent cases, Caltag and, um, we call them Caltag and Tanana, one's a federal and one's a state court um, case, basically said, okay, tribes, you can initiate child protection cases yourself. Okay, we've been doing this since when? 1986, okay, back, uh, way back from since 86. So it hasn't been until very recently <coughs> that these cases here um, that, uh, you know, we have the final blessing. Well, we have a new case coming along. It's called Parks. It has a longer name than that. We could, that's its nickname that we call, call the case. It's a Minto case, another one in the Tanana Chiefs region. And uh, so that one um, is going to kind of flesh out maybe a little bit more about jurisdiction, maybe something about due process. Um, and uh, so we're, we're a little concerned about this one. Uh, maybe Natalie might mention this one in her 
presentation. <coughs> so anyway, it's current pit picture of tribal jurisdiction, and we do like to, to take that word and say responsibility. That would be really nice if we, can, if we could think of it that way. But the tribes really have good, clear jurisdiction over determining who their members are. That's important because that's their jurisdiction, right? Who the members are. So that's a, that's a big thing. And they can determine their own form of government and their own justice system. What does their court look like? Does it look like a panel of judges or one judge? Um, and they have exclusive jurisdiction over those things. Um, it's becoming more clear over domestic relations, child protection, adoptions, and those sorts of things. Um, that's generally concurrent with the state. So both would have it. And then um, if it starts in tribal court first, they assume the jurisdiction, or if it starts in state court, they assume the jurisdiction. <coughs> um, another one that was less talked about is we have a lot of cases in our region involving children, small villages, interrelated to other villages. So we have jurisdictional issues between tribes, okay? And we struggle with this one in our region a lot. Lots of the tribal court cases involve children from more than one tribe. So we're always having to try to help facilitate um, these inter-tribal jurisdictional issues where there's concurrent jurisdiction between tribes. And um, less clear over infractions and in regulatory law and that type of thing. So that's about it. So you can see it's kind of a complex web um, this, the whole jurisdiction, the tribal courts, um, <coughs> between the th these, these entities, um, all three of the different entities. And I think you could complicate it further because the tribe to tribe <laughs> is a lot of times we have a lot of cases that involve more than one tribe. Now we only have jurisdiction as far as the state recognizes if it's concurrent jurisdiction and recognized by comedy if the tribes provide due process. Okay, the John versus Baker case says tribes don't have to do it the same way that the state does it. Okay, but what does it mean to provide due process? And I think the cases that we're going to be litigated from here forward are probably going to look closer at due process. Do you have to allow attorneys to do oral argument in your tribal court or not? Um, and kind of get to the refinement of kind of what due process is. So just uh, a little rundown on current pictures of tribal courts in TCC region, Tanana Chiefs. We have 37 tribal courts. We have 37 tribes. They are not all active at the same time. We have some, some, some tribes right now that don't have any active cases. We have uh, other tribes that will have 100 cases right now that are active in their tribal court. Most are using the council. And we see from the historic picture, maybe part of the reason why they're doing that, um, they use a pool of judges. They might have three or four other people that kind of join with that pool of judges. In the interior, our courts all use a panel of judges. So a minimum of three people to hear a case. A lot of reasons for that. There's, you know, more heads are better than one. There's safety in numbers. Um, you get a lot of respect when you have a whole panel of people uh, making the decision than just one person. So it's, it's working well. Use circles once in a while. Um, we do have some courts. Minto is separated from the council, and so some of them are separate bodies, separate peoples. <coughs> and most have appellate courts on paper, um, but they're rarely used. Okay, I've only seen in our region, I've only seen an appellate course maybe three or four times. Um, and then it's always like, okay, Lisa, what do we do? We got to do this appellate thing because we don't have a lot of practice with it. Because I think that they respect those panels of people making those decisions and I think they're, they're making the right decisions. So we have them on paper, they're not used very much. Um, and of course, back in the early days, we were run doing tribal court with no codes, no written ordinances, no codes at all, just on traditional law. And over time, we have gotten more and more detailed. It's one of the main things that I do is help the tribes and write tribal codes um, and try to keep them um, as simple as we can, but still get the job done. 
Um, the majority of cases, I think, statewide are child adoptions and child protections. Um, like Kevin said, the tribe is right there. They tend to move in earlier and, and take, in ca take cases earlier. There's no federal funding des designated for tribal courts. These guys are doing this on very, very few existing resources that they have and volunteering. And it's just amazing. They're just stepping up to the plate because they care about their people and taking care of the people there. Court cases often involve more than one tribe. Um, and then, I, mean, I, I think I could see an estimated about 3,000 cases have gone through our tribal courts in our region over the past 25 years. That's a lot of cases. When you tell this to state court judges, um, they say, gosh, that's, those, that's, we haven't had to do those cases. Thank you, <laughs> good grief. <laughs> you know, those are cases that, that, that we haven't had to deal with. So, um, so we're doing this with mostly, with very, very, very limited resources, um, with a chronic um, need for training. <laughs> there's, there's, there's not enough training to go around, there's not enough resources to go around. We are trying to create courts that meet the standards of due process in whatever shape uh, we can, um, and to just take pe care of people the best we can. The tribes are doing this with a lot of times not knowing exactly where the jurisdictional boundaries are, just moving forward and taking care of business and taking care of cases. So with that, I'm just gonna put a plug in. I'm gonna put a plug in for two things. One is <laughs> we do have a, um, actually, Kevin and I, we produced a film that basically has um, all this history we've been telling you all in a 60-minute, easy, user-friendly um, uh, tool uh, called Alaska Tribes, the Story of Federal Indian Law in Alaska. And then we have an annual tribal court conference, um, which is coming up. It's always during the week of the fair in Fairbanks um, at the Westmark. You're all welcome to come. There's no fee to come to this. Um, and we do send out um, information flyers, and we'll send it to the department here as well. So everyone is welcome to come to it. So with that, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> How are we on time? How are we on time? Really? Okay, our, thank you. And, uh, if you do go to the, the conference in Fairbanks during the State Fair, you might find our last speaker up there playing a guitar and oh. singing. And <laughs> <laughs> she's part of a band up there. <laughs> so our next speaker is Natalie Landreth with the Native American Rights Fund. Natalie, is, as uh, Lisa alluded to, is one of the individuals that actually goes into court and argues and argues and argues. So. I also do that outside of court. <laughs> <laughs> My point All made, thank you. the time. <laughs> and we're going to talk about one of those arguments tonight <laughs> so that we can get it on another news cycle. <laughs> um, I'm going to stay here if everyone doesn't mind. I do not have a PowerPoint. I'm not sure if my mic is working, but I can sure talk loud enough. Um, I, you just heard a lot of the history about tribal courts. For those of you that didn't know, I, in a lot of this uh, Violence Against Women Act dis dispute that's been going on, I would see a lot of totally ridiculous comments because, of course, people think the Internet is anonymous. Surprise, it's not. A lot of times, they, if you like through your Facebook page or anything, it actually tells me that some of the people who are commenting work here at UAA, <laughs> or they list your job title or your full name. Um, and people would say things like, what is this all about? Anxa got rid of these tribes years ago. Or these tribes don't have police, they don't have courts, what's all this hullabaloo about the Violence Against Women Act? You don't have to believe a thing I say. These two people have been doing this since the 70s and they're basically a formalization of ancient justice systems. They didn't always call them tribal courts. A, a lot of times it's the same respected people in a community that would be your counsel and they'd be your decision makers. A lot of times when I go to communities, I see that now where people come to them and say, I really have a problem. So they'll be in the middle of a council meeting. So-and-so up the road is firing his weapon. Someone needs to go do something about it. And it's one of those people at the table. It just doesn't look the way people think courts are supposed to look. People don't wear black robes. They don't come in with a gavel. They might hit you with something, but there really isn't a gavel. 
and they tend to be more inclusive and say things like, oh, I, you know, instead of the rules of evidence, they may say, does anyone else here want to say anything to this person, or does anyone else have anything else they'd like to add, and they're very inclusive. I'm overgeneralizing, but basically you heard they handled 3,000 cases in one region in the past 25 years. And that's just one region, and there are, you know, 12 others, although I guess 11 others, because the 13th doesn't do things like this, but 11 other regions. Southeast is incredibly active. I would venture a guess that they match your numbers, probably. Um, so there are a lot of active tribal courts. They do a lot. The single most common thing that I see, and I just litigate these things. I'm not as smart as these two. I'm not as organized. I don't know how PowerPoint works, <laughs> and I certainly couldn't put together something like that. I work off things like this. So this is what we're going to talk about. Why are these tribal courts important? Because the single most common thing you will see is a child protection case with a domestic violence component. And this is why the Violence Against Women Act was so incredibly important and why it is such a long-running argument that if I can help it will not end until this problem is fixed. They handle so many problems, tribal courts, and this is the number one. If you want to know how many tribal courts there are and where you can find them and does such and such village have, I should probably plug Alaska Legal Services Corporation has just done a whole directory, a whole book of them with the contact names and phone numbers and the list, like what you just saw compiled by um, Lisa and Kevin, of the different kinds of things they handle. And some will only handle children's cases and then some have a long list that extends onto two pages. So there are quite a few. It's not just that they do a lot, there are quite a few of them. So the issue with the most common kind of case that you see is a children's case with the DV component, and Parks is one of those cases that we'll talk about. This is someone uh, who attempted to murder his life partner, and uh, the tribe terminated his parental rights to the child that they had together. And lo and behold, he sues and says, you can't do that. I may be Alaska Native, but I'm from that village over there that's only 40 miles away, but you have no jurisdiction over me. And so if any of you are actually fascinated by this, that will be calendared and argued in the Alaska Supreme Court this summer. I will be doing the argument. Uh, we will be celebrating the victory probably 12 months later. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I have no idea. I'm, I'm really just kidding. But the, it, 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 these things are, are this isn't, people like to act like this is a lot of advocacy and that there's something really out there about what we're doing. But the fact is that these cases, the reason you saw the law shifting in this chronology that Lisa is showing you, is that we are way behind the lower 48. This law is already established. It's already established that you don't need Indian country to have jurisdiction over civil matters, especially things like children's cases. It's already established that the core of your jurisdiction is over your tribal members. It's already established that not everybody in the case involved needs to be a member of the same tribe. Whoever the impacted person was has to be either a member of the tribe or eligible for membership. These are very well established rules and we're simply applying them within Alaska. So within that context, one of the things I wanted to talk about was there was a nice little article today by Craig Medred on the cover of the dispatch. Did any of you see that today called Alaska? rape capital of the United States. Any of you see that? This is part of the long-running VAWA dispute, the VAWA's Violence Against Women Act. The, in order to resolve some of these problems, because you see it can be very complex when cases say, oh, you have jurisdiction over this person, but not that person, and if you're on this kind of land and not that kind of land, they realized that especially, this was really acute in the lower 48, but it happens up here as well, it just looks different is that people were getting away with some pretty horrific crimes if they would claim they were not members of the tribe or not native or not Indian committing domestic violence crimes on a reservation in the lower 48. Um, so the Violence Against Women Act attempted to put together, um, well, to fix this loophole basically so that people could stop making this argument and say, look, we know it's a general rule that there isn't, you know, uh, tribal criminal jurisdiction over non-Indians. That was a general rule. The Violence Against Women Act said basically, oh, there is now, and there is now in two different ways. You're gonna have criminal jurisdiction called special domestic violence jurisdiction over all people, even if they're not Indian, if they have some kind of a relationship with someone in the tribe, if they work for the tribe, if they have a partner, they're dating somebody, they have a child with somebody, they have a relationship with someone in the tribe. They really can't exercise this domestic violence jurisdiction over two non-natives that happen to live on the res because they think it's really cool. That doesn't work. That's not how they put it together. So you have to have some connection with the tribe. The other thing they did was they made it really clear that tribes have authority to issue civil protective orders over people whether they're Indian or not. 
And that's the thing where they come to your house and say you're to stay, you know, 300 yards away from that person. You are not to call them. You are not to text them. You are not to tell anybody else to bring them messages. You have no contact with them. And if you violate this, we're calling the troopers and we're going to have you picked up. That's why those are really important. They're restraining orders. A civil protective order is just a restraining order. It's not a criminal punishment. They'll be limited in time, and they will be limited in geographic scope, and they will basically tell you list procedures about how you can get it listed. That was the prize that Alaska tribes were after, was the civil domestic violence protective order to keep dangerous people away from the most vulnerable people in their village. And when someone violated that order, to be able to call the troopers and say, we have an order and you need to come enforce it and get this person away. It's a really critical tool of law enforcement. It helps with security. It helps people understand the predictability of what they're not allowed to do. Um, that was a really big deal. And then instead, what we ended up with, and that's Section 905 of the Violence Against Women Act, we ended up with Section 910 of the Violence Against Women Act put in the Thursday before the entire bill was voted on by the Senate called the Special Rule for Alaska, saying that none of these is going to apply to you. And it did something really awkward, which if I were a judge, I wouldn't know what it means. It says, none of this applies to you, but oh, by the way, we're going to put this thing called a savings clause, which means you had all the jurisdiction that you had uh, before we passed this law, even though nobody really knows the exact parameters of your jurisdiction, you have that stuff. You, you have Lisa's chart. But, but we're not going to make sure that you have the civil domestic violence protective orders. So they really muddied the waters because you end up with an exclusion and a savings clause and an unclear jurisdiction. It's just, it created a massive mess when it could have solved the problem in one fell swoop. All of a sudden they'd be able to have civil domestic violence protective orders, restraining orders, no matter who the person was. There's none of this arguing about, I'm not a member of your tribe, you can't do this to me. It would, that would have been very, very clear. Section 910 was inserted by Senator Murkowski, and there's been a lot of hullabaloo uh, since then. She has come up with a um, new rural uh, community, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm misnaming it, rural public safety uh, initiative that she wants to work on to try and solve this problem. And it has some interesting components, and you can all find this if you go to Senator Murkowski, it has two different websites. She has her own website, and then she has a Facebook page, and She's posting all of this if you want to follow a lot of this discussion and see what her proposal is. Um, it would be four tribes that would uh, be eligible each year, just four out of the 229 that we have. They would be subject to state attorney general oversight, including whether or not they're qualified to handle these kinds of restraining orders. You would be able to have, and this is a quote from the Pro Safety Initiative, civil tribal diversion remedies to offenders in drug and alcohol related state misdemeanor criminal prosecutions. So you'd be, be able to divert people who were basically charged with misdemeanors in the state system over to a tribal court in order to sentence them to some sort of alternative punishment and it would all be civil. Um, there were a couple things wrong with this proposal and we're gonna publish comments. Um, we're helping folks coordinate all their comments. Um, so you'll see these coming up in the news in the next couple weeks. We also post them on our website, and we have a VAWA page at www.narf.org that collects comments from tribes, articles about this stuff, the text of the law. It has Murkowski's proposal on there as well. There are a couple of negative things about this proposal, although it's great to see a proposal. Let's face it. It's nice that we're all focused on this, and maybe we can work something out uh, this time. Number one, it seems to indicate that would apply to only members, tribal members who perpetrate these offenses. So we're back in the quandary of people from a neighboring tribe or non-natives who commit any of these kind of offenses. It won't cover them. It limits punishments, which I've never seen before when tribes banish people, like send them away for doing something really egregious. Sometimes I've seen people banish um, a non-tribal member, but usually it's because they actually killed somebody. And sometimes the state doesn't prosecute those, but they will say, you are dead to us and you will be leaving, and I will take the keys to your house. Thank you very much. So that happens sometimes. People don't talk about that a lot, but it does happen. This would limit banishments to one year um, or uh, 20 days for your first offense. So it's the first actual limit I've seen on tribal restorative justice. It requires the consent of the, of the perpetrator. Uh, there's no full faith and credit, meaning you couldn't, theoretically, the way it's written now, if they issued a, a, a tribe issued a sentence or an order or something, Full faith and credit means you can't get it enforced through the state. The Indian Child Welfare Act, 
Uh, Senator Begich's bill that also deals with this kind of an issue has a clause in there which basically says if a tribal court issues an order, the state has to enforce it unless the person against whom it's being enforced says there was a due process violation. They wouldn't allow me to talk. They didn't tell me they were having a hearing. Something in there that suggests that you were not treated fairly by the tribal court. So there's a, a due process um, escape valve. But other than that, you should be able to get them enforced by the troopers because tribes don't have their own troopers. So that's the, those are the, the main problems. The biggest problem with the Rural Public Safety Initiative, as it's proposed, is that state, the state already does this. They already divert misdemeanors to willing tribes with the consent of people involved for different kinds of remedies. It already does this a lot because this gentleman happens to do some of them. I'm not suggesting that he endorses or any way condones or even knew what I was going to say, so <laughs> he didn't. So he's totally absolved of my comments on these different programs. He's a disinterested person, but he is one of these people that does this. These are also, there was a, a report in the Anchorage Daily News last fall that felony cases are being handled in this way because Judge Lyle, based out of Fairbanks, has done them. So has Judge Smith in the Valley. So there are already these diversions to tribal courts for sentencing some of these people in a more traditional way. What it doesn't do is handle the problem of the immediate domestic violence perpetrator living in the village and scaring the living daylights out of people. That doesn't help that. So you have a continuing problem. So another component of what tribal courts are doing, a different proposal, is the Alaska Safe Families and Villages Act proposed by Senator Begich. I believe it was introduced last year. It's going to be reintroduced this year. As it's written now, it would apply to three tribes. The project would be five years each. Civil jurisdiction over alcohol and drug offenses in general. It doesn't limit punishments. It doesn't require consent of the perpetrator. And it, these things are tied to alcohol and drugs, by the way, because it, I'm sure it will come as no surprise to you that your domestic violence issue and your child protection problems, the root of them is often someone who is very intoxicated on something. The Rural Justice Commission that issued its report in what year was it, 05 or 06? 06. 06, 95% of all crimes committed in rural Alaska are linked to alcohol. So the theory behind the Rural Public Safety Initiative of both Murkowski and Senator Begich is that if you can allow tribes to handle the alcohol and drugs in the village, basically seize them and get rid of them when they know where they are, because a lot of times they do know where they are, is that you can avert a lot of these other problems. So that's the theory behind both of those, and the Alaska Safe Families and Villages Act doesn't have the same kind of problems that Murkowski's Public Safety Initiative is. It's not limited to members. Um, it doesn't limit punishments, it doesn't require consent, and it has a full faith and credit clause. And it would allow tribes to very clearly handle a lot of these things on uh, Lisa's chart, which says, oh, this is kind of a gray area. It would allow them to do that. There's only really two ways that it would be really, um, that that could really improve the situation. And number one is to remove the limit to three and just have tribes exercise this kind of jurisdiction once they meet certain criteria, that criteria being showing you have a written code, you know, that you have an active tribal court, something like that, so that there's a certain level of predictability. And the other way that that bill could really be improved is to overturn Section 910 of VAWA, which is the special rule for Alaska. Because tribes need to be able to issue restraining orders against people that are causing problems in the villages. They just need to be able to do that. So uh, one of the interesting things that may be worth looking at for those of you that are um, uh, really involved in this issue, that's the overview of the sort of uh, why tribal courts are important and the day-to-day -day issues that they kind of handle, is that if you go to the dispatch as well, you will see, and this is March 17th, an editorial by Myron Nanning, who's president of Associated Village Council Presidents AVCP based out of Bethel. They represent 56 different tribes in the YK Delta. And they said over the course of one month between February 1st and the day that President Obama signed VAWA, 44 <coughs> battered women and children from 15 YK villages had to be served by the Bethel Domestic Violence Shelter. That's in one month. The statistics are absolutely amazing. And the vast majority of this is linked to alcohol. So there's two components and there's really a lot of different ways to address this, but we have some of them on the table now. One is to allow tribes to issue restraining orders and to get them enforced by state troopers so that you have immediate local control and local assistance. And the other is to allow them, or to acknowledge, if that's certain people's views, jurisdiction over handling alcohol and drugs 
so that they can seize things, report things, get rid of them, because a lot of times they know where the problems are. That, we contend, would go a long way to helping the domestic violence problem in the village without some massive uh, federal appropriation. So I want to give a, a very, very brief, um, uh, and extremely brief, because it's still being litigated, so it's not appropriate to go into great detail, about the Parks case, for those of you that might be interested in following the Supreme Court case, it's one of those linked child protection, domestic violence fueled by drugs. That will be in the Alaska Supreme Court at some point this summer. The issue there is that the respondent is from a neighboring tribe. The tribe terminated his parental rights to one child. He has six others. The state has terminated his parental rights to all the other six others. So he had rights to only one. The tribe terminated it based on repeated instances of domestic violence towards the mother and the child. They had six hearings over the course of, I believe, 11 months, during which this person participated. The issues on appeal are basically twofold. And I'm oversimplifying because we wrote 50 pages. And um, leave it to a lawyer to take like two simple issues and be like, I can write a book about that. <laughs> <laughs> I have 75 footnotes that are very relevant to that <laughs> one issue. <laughs> and I'm going to read them all <laughs> to you right now. Um, so there are basically two issues in that case, and both of them touch upon stuff we've talked about here today and stuff in these laws. This gentleman says, you may have jurisdiction over your tribal members, but I'm a native from a different village, and so you do not have jurisdiction to terminate the parental rights of a non-member Indian. That's how it's referred to in federal law. They're called non-member Indians. Um, so... This, even though the trigger for child protection, the Indian Child Welfare Act doesn't really care where the parents are from. The trigger is the membership or eligibility of membership of the child. That's where the tribe has jurisdiction. So that's going to be an interesting case for those of you that want to look at that. The second component there is the due process issue, is that uh, Parks is contending that he did not receive due process in tribal courts. So there will be some discussion about what tribal courts have to provide in order to have their orders enforced by a state court or by a state trooper. So that is to be determined. We don't know. I, I joke. I really shouldn't joke. It's a very serious case um, with very serious consequences for establishing the parameters of solving some of these problems. But you see how a lot of these things are tied together. It may look like just the Violence Against Women Act, or it may look like the Indian Child Welfare Act, or the Rural Justice Commission does a study about alcohol. This is all linked. And it's all got one goal in mind, which is public safety in the villages. And if you've been to any one of the 140 villages that do not have a law enforcement officer, you know that it is terrifying. When it is 2 o'clock in the morning and you hear a gun going off and everybody's running around outside on either their snow machines or their four-wheelers in the summer, and you're the only one who's not armed. So it's an incredibly important issue. If that's how I feel or how someone else feels being there for a day or a night or a couple of days, imagine living there and knowing that there is no trooper anywhere near you or local law enforcement, you need someone to be able to come in and help. And that is all that this is about. It's not about asserting some kind of jurisdiction so that you can claim it as a political victory. It's about making sure that the most vulnerable people that live in villages have some sign of public safety. This is not about Alaska Native villages having a unique problem. Because I guarantee you, if you told Anchorage that they couldn't have law enforcement, the rape and violence rate would go way up. Tribes have been told, you can't do these certain things. And a lot of times they're threatened. If you uh, try and arrest somebody, we're going to arrest you for trying to impersonate a police officer. They have been restricted in their exercise of law enforcement. And you end up with this problem. Because if you create a hole, you have to fill it with something else. And that's the core issue here, and I hope that a lot of these different initiatives, the Alaska Safe Families and Villages Act, Murkowski's initiative has similar pieces. Some of this can begin to fill in these gaping holes because there's a real need out there. And it's a need created by our own arguments about what kind of jurisdiction they have. So that's all I wanted to say. And again, nothing I just said should in any way reflect <laughs> on the views of the person of impeccable credibility and integrity <laughs> sitting next to me, Magistrate McLean. <laughs> One last thing that uh, what Natalie said, on that directory for tribal courts, it is a published book. It will come out probably annually, but it's also online, so it can be updated fairly regularly. If you go to Alaska Legal Services on their website, it is a, uh, that directory is on there.
can go to the Alaska Justice Center website, um, uh, justice.uaa.edu, and um, you'll get our homepage. At the top of our homepage is a blurb about the tribal courts program tonight, and there is a little bullet point that says, click here to download all the materials. And so you can get copies of the PowerPoint, you can get copies of also the uh, History of Tribal Courts by Lisa Yeager, and also a list of resources. And that has all the links on it to the Tribal Court Directory. It also has a link to Alaska Legal Services' recent publication on uh, tribal jurisdiction. So it will give you links to a lot of that information. Thank you. Okay, we got thumbs up? Okay. Our fourth and final speaker is Magistrate Judge Chris McLean from Galena. And I've had the opportunity to listen to him a couple of times up in, in Fairbanks because he d he's part of that uh, training that happens, as Lisa talked to, in uh, Fairbanks uh, in August. And I, I'm candidly, I'm very impressed and pleased with what cooperation is, is happening from the state side on his end. Your Honor? going to come up to the podium so I can kind of see all of you. Um, I promise I don't have another PowerPoint presentation either. Um, Hopefully that's not going to be echo Okay. Can you all hear me? Okay. Uh, first off, I want to thank UAA for uh, inviting us all here and uh, uh, being able to talk to you tonight. Uh, the second thing I want to do is, um, you know, just thank Lisa Yeager uh, and kind of recognize the work that she's been doing. Uh, for the last 32 years, I'm 32 years old, so she's been <laughs> serving <laughs> and fighting for rural Alaskans my whole life. And so if we could just give her a round of applause for the work she's done. <laughs> Thanks again, Lisa. Um, so I've got kind of a tough act to follow with this whole jurisdictional uh, conversation we've had going here. Um, what I've been asked to do is try to, I guess, explain how I don't get involved in the jurisdictional issue and uh, do what's best for our communities in the villages. So what I'm gonna kinda ask you to do is kinda uh, close your eyes for a minute and I wanna kinda paint the, the canvas here for you, set the scene. Uh, in my day-to-day -day life, we live around 300 miles off the road system from Fairbanks. Uh, we, uh, most all of us in the villages there, uh, in the interior that I serve as a state magistrate judge are rural subsistence uh, users, meaning that we collect uh, driftwood off the, the river banks uh, to burn uh, for heat. Uh, we have wood yards where we go out and harvest firewood in the winters on our snow machines. We hunt moose, we fish, uh, trap. That's our day-to-day -day realities. And I have the, uh, I guess, honor, I, I would call it, to uh, serve uh, com the communities in the interior who are are so unique uh, in my opinion and uh, just special you know and uh, they've pretty much how I when I go and I do talking circles and I and I spend the night uh, in these villages and I've become close friends with many of the the, the village and community and and hand in hand, the tribal leadership in those communities, uh, you know, they are the last people of their kind uh, in the whole world. And, you know, what, what we're trying to do, and you saw the kind of trinity, as people refer to it as, as, as jurisdiction, is, is really, you know, uh, create a, a community, an environment that's safe, uh, that uh, you can raise your children in, we're all connected and depend on each other. That's rural Alaska in my opinion. And so I've been asked by UAA today and, uh, to come and talk to you about the experiences that I've had the last four or so years with Lisa Yeager and some other uh, state officials such as the Fairbanks District Attorney's Office, Fairbanks Public Defender's Office, uh, University of Alaska Fairbanks has traveled some with us um, to give insight on uh, restorative rehabilitative processes to me. Um, and what you know basically what we've done is we've been able to uh, I guess create a dialogue I've been able to had the opportunity to fly in <coughs> to some of these really isolated villages uh, that I serve as a, as a magistrate and conduct court where court state court has never been conducted before and and get the input and the voices and uh, 
the recommendations from these communities that I, that I don't live in, that I live close to. Uh, and it's really helped me kind of put faces to the people that I have to see in court over the phone and deal with their cases. Um, I'd like to, to touch on some of the things, some of the obstacles that the state court uh, justice system is trying, to, has always tried to overcome. Some of those things are the logistics, the isolation of these rural communities from the road system and from uh, the state judicial officers and the other state, you know, the attorneys and, and people that uh, serve those areas. Um, there's also uh, basically this type of outreach that we've been working on is uh, helps to overcome any cultural or language barriers uh, that may exist uh, from the isolation of those areas. And it also addresses the limited uh, resources of law enforcement uh, and counseling and rehabilitation services. Um, in a lot of the villages, uh, it's been spoken of earlier tonight, there's not local law enforcement. Uh, you know, I hate, to, I hate to name drop, but in some of the villages, uh, you know, um, the help that they get are from the local families. The local, you know, the communities depend on uh, people like Earl and Justin Smalk and Caltag uh, to, you know, protect those communities when things happen. The state troopers are, are uh, located in Galena, and it takes a while for them to get in there. So any, anything that happens immediately, uh, you, you know, imagine putting yourself in a situation. I mean, you probably, many of you are used to having, being able to call 911 and have law enforcement there. I mean, this is, I'm trying to paint a picture of, for you to uh, really understand what rural Alaska and, and the justice system is in, in the area that I serve. Um, you know, so, and then also uh, touch on the, the uh, counseling services. <coughs> very, very limited. We have a counseling uh, office out of Galena and we have really high turnover rate. Right now we're very blessed with having two great counselors that are uh, serving our area for an extended period of time. But they, don't, they aren't able to get out to those villages once every month, once every three months. And uh, there's a lot of obstacles that the counseling services uh, have to overcome in addition. And what I've tried to do in the area that I serve is that I've tried to create a dialogue with those, uh, those with the counselors, with the law enforcement, uh, with the community leaders, uh, and the court system uh, to all be on the same page uh, with things that are going on in any particular case. Um, and it, it, it seems like it's been working in our area. Um, one of the main things I try to do, uh, we've I got appointed to the bench in 2008, so about five years ago. Um, I currently stack my cases up with, um, if you're not familiar with a calendar call, once a month, all the uh, criminal cases come in front of me with the attorneys and the defendant, and we talk about the status of the case, whether it's going to trial, whether they need more time, whether it's gonna be a change of plea hearing, and when those cases uh, come to calendar call, we, I do it village specific, community specific, and stack cases for those areas. And if uh, the cases that aren't going to go to trial and the, the defendants come up with, uh, with their attorney and with the state in agreement, what they're going to plead out to, uh, we stack those cases and we, we go out to the community itself and we conduct court in the, the community uh, as much as we can. And uh, this is fairly recent. We just started doing this in 2010. And, you know, it takes a fair amount of money and resources and planning. Um, on these trips that we've done to these communities, uh, Lisa Yeager and Tana <coughs> Chiefs Conference has come to all of them with us. We've been able to hold conduct talking circles and uh, after our court hearings. And uh, basically, what, in my opinion, what court, bringing court there does is it creates that transparency so that those rural community members can see what the, the state court processes are and. And then we've taken it kind of one step further and we utilize a uh, procedure uh, in some of the appropriate sentencing is called circle sentencing where that actually takes into consideration uh, the community's input for a state judicial officer uh, to help them determine an appropriate sentence. And um, in the state jurisdiction, there's that jurisdiction word again, um, 
we have to, state judicial officers have to consider what's called the Cheney criteria in sentencing, which, which guides uh, what we need to consider in crafting a sentence. And I found that um, going out to those communities and doing the, the, uh, the circles and giving the community an opportunity to, to input into the state court process, um, it's basically been a form of a pre-sentence report. Felony cases have pre-sentence reports and without getting in the legalese of it, uh, misdemeanor cases uh, often don't have that. But it, what it does is it kind of creates a, uh, an opportunity for me, it's basically a pre-sentence report, to hear all the factors that I normally wouldn't probably hear uh, over the phone uh, conducting court telephonically from the district court in Galena. So um, it comes up with a lot, you know, it, it, I'm very, I'm very pleased and happy with the, the outcomes uh, over the last three going on four years. Um, I wish I had some of my local community uh, members to, to be here. I normally just do very short talking, hand the mic to them and let the local people tell you about what their thoughts are and what we've been doing. So um, I'll throw in a plug for Lisa and the Tana Chiefs Conference uh, this fall if you want to come up and listen to them. But um, what I've found from community members and even defendants after the fact is that what there's so much that happens in my opinion with these circles that are being conducted uh, that are, that is outside the court you know the way Lisa facilitates these circles and she doesn't have time to explain it at this conference but um, you're 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 faced with your community and you're able to talk with your community about the harm done. It gives you an opportunity to gain cultural wisdom from your elders, from your other community members who've lived life stories, and they tell those stories in those communities, in those circles. And it basically brings you kind of full circle and, and gives you, in my opinion, kind of a game plan of which you can come back into good standing within a community. You're living in an area of under 200 people, most people that you've known your whole life and, and probably are related to. And so we call it, you know, village gossip or whatever, you know, it, it co totally cuts out with that and you talk as a community and that defendant, uh, you know, uh, the person who's in front of the state court often has, has, has the opportunity to come back in good standing with the family, with any, any uh, victims or the harm done and uh, also at the same time is able to hear from his or her own people what a valued person that they are to them and to that community. And I've heard story after story, uh, those kind of anecdotal stories about, uh, you know, the positive effects this is having outside the statistics. It might, you know, be lowering crime rates in, in the area that I serve. Uh, it might not. There's a lot of factors going in. But what you can't, what you can't question is, is how the people themselves feel about what we're doing and the opportunities that kind of we're creating by doing this type of outreach in, in the area that I serve. So in addition to that, you know, they, the circle gives a recommendation to the state court, state judicial officer for, for us to consider and, um, you know, really helps us to try to, you know, sentence that person really in a rehabilitative way because at the end of the day, uh, oftentimes what I've seen is that um, some, an event may happen, three or four days later the family doesn't want the court case to be going through, they want that person back into the village they care about and they depend on them to you know, get firewood and take care of the kids and just they miss them and, and at the end of the day you, they don't want them to, to go to jail to become a hardened person in their opinion and, and, and have to go through this whole whole process at, you know and so I think that it, it's important to listen to the communities and, 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 and find, help them find a way to allow that person to come back and be a meaningful productive person who has hope that they can do better and be uh, there for their family or community uh, than otherwise they normally wouldn't. Uh, if I just sentence somebody to jail, I'm not really touching on all of those issues. If I do a circle of sentencing or a talking circle within the community and uh, they talk about the issue and we come up with a game plan and a strategy for that person to hopefully not recidivate and uh, kind of a re-entry program strategy for them to come back in good standing and give back to their community, whether it's through community work service to the elders of the village, uh, counseling services, what have you, all of those have been have been done and accomplished. It, it sets out a game plan for that person and and the people in my area are very helpful and I think 
working with me and the other state uh, officers to try to incorporate that into the, the state court system in our area. So um, I think I'm probably rambling at this point, but it's kind of hard for me to put the last four years of my life into a 15 minute conversation for you guys. Um, so uh, I guess in closing, I want to talk about some common ground that I have noticed. Without getting into the jurisdictional issues, tribal judges and leaders uh, in, those, in the villages that I serve and that I live in and that I love and care about, it's a reality. Uh, it's a reality every day of my life and, and uh, you know, I respect those people wholeheartedly, what they do. I've been on, I've been in Galena for about five years and my, you know, my daughter's 10 now and we were five when we moved out there and we play baseball and basketball tournaments. I coach, you know, Little League and baseball and I've got 10 kids at my house every single day, all 10 year olds and we travel to these villages, you know, in 24 foot all well boats, 150 were down there in, you know, like two hours and we're playing and a thousand people come together, all five villages and we're all together and we're cooking out and, you know, singing, dancing and just spending time together and it's something that I can't really, I don't know, put into words but I think my point is, is that I feel like I'm starting to get roots there and I can only imagine, you know, with the job that I have to do, which is to be a fair and impartial and detached judicial officer, uh, you know, to be a tribal court judge and be blood related to these people, because I care about the people in my area significantly. I mean, I really do. I mean, I feel like I got roots there. And so I have so much respect for the work that the tribal court judges are doing as they expand out and, and figure out what they're going to do with the roles and jurisdiction, which I'm not commenting on. <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, in the village, we all depend on each other. We all wear different hats. You may be a tribal court judge. You may be an auntie, uncle, grandpa, dad, whatever, brother. You're Alaska citizen too, you're a United States citizen, and that's how I look at it. I get through the jurisdictional issues, and we try to you know, live happy, fulfilling lives in, the, in Bush, Alaska. So with that, thank you very much for listening to me rambling on tonight. <laughs>
Uh, that's near Wisconsin someplace. He told us this story. And the story basically was there was this young high school basketball player. He was phenomenal on the court. And he, he was just totally great, awesome. However, in the classroom, the hallway, and in the cafeteria, he was a complete jerk. I mean, he was arrogant. He was uh, he backtalked teachers. And they, they were pretty well frustrated with him. They, were, they had tried the progressive disciplines that the schools had, and they were actually thinking about expelling him, which is he was their best basketball player. But one of the teachers came up and said, how about if we had the elders talk to him? The principal, wanting to save this young man, said, okay, sure, let's try it. So they got three elders who volunteered. They went in, and they set three chairs in the gymnasium for the elders and one chair for the young man. And as they sat, took their seats, all these people began to crowd into the gymnasium. And one of the elders stood up and says, please, we'd like to talk to this young man alone. Everybody respected the elders, they all left. They were in there for about an hour. The young man came out, didn't say to anything to anybody. The next morning when school came around, he was there, he walked into the classroom, sat down at his desk, opened up his book, got his pencil and paper ready, and he started working. By the end of the week, he was starting to help people with their homework, with their lessons, so if they were having trouble. The teachers were amazed. So they went to the elders, the principal went to the elders and said, what did you do? I mean, whatever it was, we need to bottle that. <coughs> the elders said, we asked him about what he thought his strengths were. Obviously, he said, basketball. How do you know that? Because uh, people clap and cheer when I'm on the court and I make points. Do they do that when you're not on the court? No. Do they clap and cheer when you're in school? No. Hmm. The point is, they focused on his strengths. And he made the decision himself. He wasn't told, he was not judged, but he made the decision to change. And that is the most effective change we can, anybody can make if you make it as opposed to being forced upon you. That's an example of what can happen in a restorative or a tribal court mechanism, especially with a circle. Because people are valued. Everyone here is valuable. I used to tell, as a police officer, each and every one of you was worth my life because I was sworn to protect you. I believe that. I've always believed that. I still do. So that's as much as I, I think my speaking part is done. So I will get my stuff and I will leave. But I want to ask all of you, please, I hope you, you picked up some more awareness of what this, this issue is. And please support it. Inroads are being made. I know it will happen over time, but it, I'm positive and I'm hopeful that we can be able to do this because folks out there, no matter where you're from, you're worth it. Drive safely on the way home. Uh, we have time for uh, questions of the panelists, and so if you have a question, I'd, be, I'd like to pass this microphone to you so that we can uh, capture that on our uh, videotape and podcast. So you were my first hand back here. Uh, thank you very much. This was wonderful. Uh, say your name so that everyone oh. Claire Waddup with Partners for Progress. We help people going through therapeutic courts, addicted offenders, and we help people coming out of prison. So this is a question for Kevin. Um, we talked m many years ago about um, a very tentative collaboration between the um, Bethel Therapeutic Court and a some tribal ch uh, chiefs, tribal elders in the villages to help monitor people who had graduated or were working with the therapeutic courts. Um, and it kind of ties in with what Walt Monaghan was saying and also with um, what... Uh, uh, Magist Judge Magistrate McLean was saying, 
do you see that being advanced at all? Is there any talk about trying to work more closely between the therapeutic courts and um, tribal courts? Thank you. Thank you. I would say generally I'm, I'm incredibly optimistic in the direction that we're moving within this state. Um, I started working with tribes about a dozen years ago and, and things were, were incredibly adversarial at that time and there really was no partnership, no collaboration. Um, I think that there has been. Uh, the problem I that I see is that they've been in fits and starts and there hasn't been the consistency I in, uh, in, in them happening. They're grant funded programs, um, they rely heavily on uh, personality, uh, individual within the community. There's been some really great projects, uh, diversions and, and therapeutic projects that I think have been going and then stop. Uh, I'm actually very excited that, that Magistrate McLean is here with us today because uh, he's keeping this going. And to me, this is the first time I've seen uh, a partnership that really has progressed and had the support of the state. Uh, and, and so that to me is, is what I, I, I find very exciting. Uh, you have to pardon me because my voice is hoarse and I can't see well and of course I'm unbalanced and my English is horrendous as ever. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, it's more of the comments that I'll make um, is that Walter Monaghan, I appreciate what you're doing because about Two, three days ago, I read an article that you had written in the paper, and I'm like, wow, at long last, something everybody can relate to. And then I said, I hope. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, but thank you, and I really appreciate that. And, and I thank the, all of the speakers, but a lot of times when I attend classes or, or go to any, any functions, the only notes I take are, are, are the outstanding, the most outstanding uh, discrepancies or where there's anywhere from zero to tiny little progress made. However, I keep saying that if we all work together, no matter who we are, think about the huge progresses we would make. And when we come to communicate, sure, it's good to do this, but it's also good to do this. <laughs> and it's better to do this than this. <laughs> and they're like, the Statehood Act came in 1959, that's 40 years ago, right? And between that and now, it's like 74 years. And a lot of the things I hear and read about when it comes to, uh, to the judicial system is how us poor, isolated Native villages have not learned anything if anything, uh, or, or has made a really tiny little progress. However, I would say it's the other way around. Us so-called dumb people, um, actually we're not dumb, I'm just, I'm just, um, I don't know the proper English word. Anyway, in that amount of time, actually, we all have learned a lot more than, than our counterparts have in that amount of time. Mm -hmm. And you could have, I mean, like, we all could have done the same thing given that amount of time. We all could have learned together if we are working together or meeting halfway in between. And then, and then one thing that I've observed over and over again, again, ever since I was a youngster, the more funding there is, the more problems arise. <laughs> so I can tell you that 
in a lot of the so-called isolated villages, a lot, a lot of things have been worked on and solved without spending a penny. Mm -hmm. But that's because people care. So I get upset when I hear somebody say that that no people don't really do not know what they're doing in the villages. It's the other way around. And then when it comes to statistics, I don't ever agree with the statistics that anyone comes up with. Like somebody said, did you see 95% of the women, Alaska Native women, are raped? No. Somebody said that. Or maybe I'm wrong. Anyway, but, but when you really <coughs> look at things, when the Alaska Native women are sexually abused, assaulted, it's not the lesser number of the Alaska Native males are doing that. And, and more, more of that happens in bigger villages, bigger cities, by other, other males other than the Alaska Natives. Um, when, I, when I get, uh, when I'm passionate about something, I want to talk and talk and talk, and then yet I say like, I better not. Because like earlier when you guys were laughing, I wish I was laughing with you, but considering all that has gone on, I really was trying my darndest not to cry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. A, a couple more questions. Hello, I'm Sarah Kin. Um, I'm a uh, justice major here at UAA. And I was wondering um, what the tribal <coughs> courts were doing about the sexual assault victims of Native w women. What exactly, if there is anything that's new going on? Uh, you mean people in tr what tribes do now for yeah. victims of sexual assault? In terms of services, I actually don't know the answer to that question. But um, legal, the only aspect I can really answer is what they do legally and what they have been doing for a long time are issuing restraining orders against their own members or non-member Indians. Mm -hmm. But a lot of tribes will not issue restraining orders against non-native people because the inevitable result of that is that person gets a lawyer or tells the state and then the state sues the tribe and then I have to come in and defend the tribe. So they're worried about the real pushback from state authorities if they try and protect someone against an, a non-native, you know, a Caucasian perpetrator. So right now I see DV protective orders issued against their own tribal members committing crimes or um, non-member natives, like people who are members of other villages. But you basically have to be native in order for them to be willing to issue a protective order, in my experience, but then again, I, I only see a small window of them. There may be some people that do do that, um, but I, I think it's pretty rare. I think people are really gun shy about going, that's the, the limit of their jurisdiction, and they're gun shy about doing that. Because in this area of law, when you lose a case, you lose for everybody. Some private business that has a lawsuit that loses their case, they might lose money. You lose authority, you lose jurisdiction, you lose public safety if you lose one of these cases as a tribe. Because it'll set back your ability to run your own community years, decades. And so a lot of times I honestly tell people, I don't know that I would do that. Because I'm not sure you can win X case. So, but I don't know if you know more about that. I was just going to add one thing, and I know that there's times when there are sexual assaults that that's, they're never going to see the, a state officer. It's never going to come to the light of the day of a state, and if the tribe doesn't deal with it itself, mm -hmm. that it's not going to get dealt with. So I know that there's quite a few of our tribal courts that have deal with sexual assault. Do they have jurisdiction over it? They're dealing with it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, to a certain extent. But I just wanted to add one thing. Um, when, when Chris was talking about um, when we do circle sentencing, a lot of times we'll um, come to a point when usually somebody needs treatment, somebody needs services or something like that. So while we're combining kind of the community, the, the tribe, the tribal, you know, uh, in the circle there, a lot of times the, uh, the um, 
uh, resources become available through like the nonprofit, like through Tan and Achieve. So we're, mm -hmm. we're actually stretching the resources, getting people into treatments faster and, and that type of thing by, th by this collaboration, state and tribe. I, I would like to add to just a second. Um, this is an area that, that is a big problem. Uh, it's a big problem because we don't have resources to respond to it, uh, or the state is not willing to devote the resources to, to respond to it. Uh, the state fights tribes and saying that they don't have criminal jurisdiction and this is not the type of case that they could hear, even though the reality is they're the ones stuck hearing them a lot of times. And so it's going to be a fight anytime the tribe does try to do something like this. And then the reality is, is that we don't uh, have uh, trained medical personnel in the communities to be able to do, to collect evidence that they need to prosecute a sexual assault. That uh, is pretty well limited just to our hub communities, Fairbanks and Anchorage. And so unless you live in that community, you're out of luck. The state won't prosecute the case. It is a serious problem. Wasn't there a, a report that uh, the Justice Center did, a snapshot on sexual assault in Bethel one year? So actually, if you go to the website for- uh, Can you wait while well, we give you the mic? <laughs> 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 on the, uh, the Justice Center's website, you can look down the publications that they have listed and I believe a few years back, how far, Andre? Last year. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> how time flies. <laughs> but uh, if you could look back there, you'll see those kind of, uh, uh, not only the, the statistics, but the, the <coughs> stories behind it. And uh, it's pretty revealing. There was also a study that was done in 07, started 06, I think it was by Amnesty International that had done one on the human rights uh, condition for sexual assault victims up here. And well, he could mention on the Justice website, it's the Alaska Victimization Survey, if that's what people look for. The Alaska Justice Victimization Survey. I am told that uh, we have come to the, uh, the end. I'd like to point out, however, that the Justice faculty has been involved in this issue for quite some time, Dr. Rose. Uh, Dr. Merstel, uh, head of the uh, Alaska Justice Statistical Analysis Center, uh, Deb Perriman, who's the director of the uh, uh, legal studies, and I hope that you'll think about legal studies. Uh, you, there's Professor Brandeis, and I see Dr. Forston sitting over here. And uh, all of this would not be possible, including the free coffee and cookies, if it weren't for uh, Barb Armstrong, who's done it. Uh, thank you very much. And, uh, Lastly, I'd like to thank Walt Monaghan for monitoring our uh, presentation and for our esteemed panel. And I assure you that I assure you, excuse me, that they will be around for a few more questions. So, no. thank you all and <laughs> good night. <laughs>